Hey everybody and welcome to Breaking Biotech. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please hit the like, subscribe, or the share button and I would greatly appreciate it. I'm uh, glad to be with you guys and it has been a little while. I've uh, been busy at work the first week after my last video and then last week I was actually on vacation in beautiful Lake Tahoe and I recommend everybody go check it out if you're in the California area because it is pretty gorgeous. Uh, you don't really get to see a blue lake quite like that. So anyway, but glad to be back here. And uh, I did have time to put together a, a presentation on Regenix Bio. So that's going to be our main topic for today. But we are going to talk about some other uh, exciting stuff that's been going on in the news and in the biotech sector. So yeah, we're just going to gonna get through it and uh, have a good old time. So with that, I, I'm going back in time a little bit. It's been a couple weeks, so some of these, some of this news is old, and I'm going to skim through it, but we did get a U.S. GDP print for Q1, came in line with forecast. There was a slight miss on the trade balance, but it didn't seem to be a huge deal because uh, the markets at the end of last week ended up rallying quite a bit. So there was some drama surrounding some tariffs with Mexico that got resolved in about seven days, so... Uh, completely missed that drama, I guess, for, for today's talk, but it was pretty relevant for the markets. And then last Friday, we got a non-farm payroll print that was a miss by 110,000, which is, seems pretty significant, but unemployment stayed in line with forecasts at 3.6%. And uh, I, th I believe the labor force participation rate was also unchanged, or at least it wasn't uh, too far from the forecast, which is good news. So it seems like we're kind of coming up to a max of unemployment at this stage and even additional jobs aren't really going to change it too much so uh, it's good for the US economy it doesn't signal any recession even though these are kind of these are lagging numbers I feel like looking at housing is much more of a leading indicator or looking at initial jobless claims and we're gonna get a print on that this week actually so uh, this is good news for the US as it stands and um, yeah we'll leave it at that so some other news that happened last week was that Bluebird Bio announced conditional marketing authorization for Zynteglo, which is their autologous CD34 uh, cell transplant with this uh, beta A um, T87Q globin gene. So this is for transfusion-dependent beta thalassemia, and it's the first um, approval, first gene therapy approval for beta thalassemia, transfusion-dependent beta, beta thalassemia. So this is great news for Bluebird. The stock rallied at the end of last week quite a bit and then gave back a bunch of gains today. So I actually bought a few more shares today in, in Bluebird Bio because I think this is a very good news and it signals that uh, we should be able to see more of these types of approvals in the future for Bluebird because we know that they're involved in a number of different um, blood disorder trials, and one in particular is sickle cell disease, which is a much larger market than transfusion-dependent beta thalassemia. So this is uh, very good news. We don't know what the price is yet, although some analysts suggest uh, 450,000 euros to 1 million, and I believe, I'd have to go back, but their, uh, their presentation is worth looking at, their corporate presentation, and I might just do another video on that entirely because there's a lot of good info on how they decided or how they're going to decide uh, on coming to a, to a price for, for patients, given that it should be a one-time therapy and, uh, and it should be able to, to help patients with their quality of life quite a bit. So this is uh, good news for them. And uh, yeah, they're, they're talking about filing with the FDA at the end of the year. Uh, it seems like most patients with this disorder are in, the, are in Europe, so I you know they're going to have a strategic plan for how they want to move forward with that. But uh, this is good news. In other biotech-related news, Amarin was granted priority review from the FDA for their supplemental NDA for uh, Vasipa, and that's to expand the label of Vasipa to include patients that um, that have triglycerides. I think it's between it's under 500 milligram per deciliter. So it's to to really get that big patient population of patients that are on statins that have. Um, high triglycerides, but not extremely high triglycerides, which is over 500 milligram per deciliter. So uh, the stock rallied quite a bit on this information, and it so the the result of this was that the PDUFA date was moved from I think they were expecting January, uh, and it was moved up to September 28th of this year. So that's a it's pretty big news. It suggests to me that the FDA really um, 
believes in in the the compound and its ability to uh, help prevent a lot of deleterious effects associated with having high triglycerides. So, you know, it's like four or five months worth of revenue that the company is now going to receive um, with that expanded label. So I'm surprised the stock didn't maintain its gains as it was after this news, but uh, we did see a bit, I think it's in the 18s right now, um, after after Monday. I'm recording this on uh, the 10th of June. So uh, very good news there. We don't know whether or not there's going to be an advisory committee. I, I don't think there's going to be one, but uh, the FDA, I think, has a lot of time to decide whether or not they want to hold an, an advisory committee for this compound or this expanded label. And I think if they did announce an advisory committee, it would have a, a negative effect on the stock, at least short term. But for me personally, I think that'd be just an opportunity to buy because I don't see um, the bear case for Ameren at this point. So with that, uh, let's get into Regenix Bio. All right. So I originally got interested in them because of the Zolgensma approval, really. I, I hadn't heard too much about them, only that they were the licensor of the AAV2 Avexis that is now Novartis. And, uh, and I figured, you know, with all the hype and all the generous multiples that gene therapy companies get, I figured I should look into Regenix and see if there's more upside for this company or whether or not it's, uh, it's really an overbought territory. So uh, as it stands today, market cap is $1.77 billion, trading at $48.24 per share. And this is near all-time highs, I believe. Uh, I, th I think the, the chart I looked at was just like a year or so chart. And um, the the stock rallied on the Zolgensma approval. Then we had a couple down days with all the uh, the drama surrounding the the potential Mexico tariffs, and now it's back up to about forty eight dollars per share. So they specialize in AAV development. So their whole patent portfolio involves what they say hundreds of of different AAVs, different forms of AAVs, and they develop these so that they can either use them themselves in some rare diseases or license them to other companies so that they can develop their favorite drug using uh, an AAV. And so, you know, right off the bat, the fact that we have all these different licensing agreements makes coming up with a model relatively difficult because there's so many different milestone payments and you have to track, you know, I have here 20 different partnered products. So uh, it makes it a little difficult to, to anticipate what kind of revenue they're going to get from a licensor perspective. But uh, like I said, 20 partnered products for this NAV technology, uh, which is what they call their, their platform, which includes all these different AAVs. Uh, not too sure what NAV stands for. Couldn't really find it on any of their documentation, but it's what their, their trademark is for it. So they have partnerships with Biogen, uh, obviously Novartis and Nevexis, Sarepta, Takeda, as well as many others. And most of them are in like phase one, preclinical, phase one, two. So... Again, that makes it even more difficult because there's going to be milestones with getting FDA approval as well as certain sales goals. So, uh, and we see that with the Avexis partnership, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But um, the real benefit, or I think what's maintaining the share price as it is, is their own um, in-house programs that they're running, and they have some some interesting ones. But the major one that that I think the market is anticipating approval for is this RGX314. And this is for the, the indication they're looking for first is wet age-related macular degeneration or wet AMD. And this is a progressive disease that includes blurring of vision, um, vision loss due to these leaky blood vessels. And uh, this happens also in diabetics. And I don't think we completely understand the mechanism, but we do know that an important factor in this process is, is the deleterious expression of VEGF. And uh, I think it stands for vascular endothelial growth factor. And what this uh, molecule does is it basically stimulates angiogenesis, and which is new blood vessel formation. But there's something about the blood vessel formation that leads to them not closing properly. So the blood just kind of leaks in the eye. And uh, this also happens in, in cancer. You get a high expression of VEGF as the tumor wants to get new blood vessels um, supplying it with nutrients. So, so we don't know exactly why it happens, but what ends up happening is you get these leaky blood vessels that lead to this uh, blurring of vision and progress progression progressive vision loss. So if you can stop the VEGF progression or the VEGF expression 
then you can prevent this angiogenesis, so these new blood vessels, and then prevent the, the vision loss. So companies have had a lot of success with this, with antibodies uh, that, are, that bind to VEGF and prevent its ability to, as a transcription factor, to promote, the, um, promote angiogenesis. So, so that's been the standard of care as of yet. And there's a few products on the market now, and I'm going to talk about them a little bit later. But uh, what Regenix is trying to do is to do a gene therapy where cells of the eye or surrounding the eye, really, it doesn't as long as the the gene product is produced, it doesn't really matter what cell actually expresses it. But I think ideally, what they want is the the retinal cells to produce it. But if they can get uh, a gene that'll produce an antibody against VEGF then it'll supersede the need for them to get these uh, monthly injections of anti-VEGF antibodies to prevent the blood vessel formation. So that's, that's their goal here, and they're using an AAV8 vector to uh, transfect this anti-VEGF FAB uh, fragment that should bind to VEGF and prevent the, the problems associated with wet AMD. So that's the goal, and uh, it should be you know, expecting a one-time treatment, all the benefits associated with general uh, gene therapies are involved here. So, you know, the, the typical questions are, are what come up, but um, yeah, so it's a, it's a sub-retinal injection, which is the same as what they do for the antibodies, but um, here, seemingly, you only need one injection. And there's about 2 million patients that suffer from this disease around the world, and uh, yeah, and it would be you know, for a quality of life perspective would be a huge boom for patients. So they have some data on it. This is a phase, I believe, 1-2-A one, two, one, two trial is what they call it. So they looked, they did this injection on patients with a bunch of different doses, looked at one month, one year. Uh, they also have like a six-month time point in that, in that frame, but they're expanding this to include a cohort 4 and cohort 5, which has even higher dose of uh, genome copies per eye so they can really push the system to the max and see what kind of improvement they can get. So what we see here is that cohort 1 and cohort 2, uh, it's okay. They start to see this expression in the aqueous humor of the protein, but the, the benefit is relatively weak. In cohort 3, though, at 6 times 10 to the 10 genome copies per eye, uh, they get robust expression of, you know, 160 0.2 nanogram per mil of the in the aqueous humor, and this is maintained at one year post treatment. So what ended up happening here, though, in cohort three is that of this six patient group, only three of them were considered responders. The rest needed anti VEGF injections throughout the first year of treatment um, to rescue the the issues that they were still having with their wet AMD. So. The, the average mean number of injections is 2.3 throughout the year, which is a huge improvement from the typical uh, like 10 to 12 that patients need throughout the year if they're just being treated uh, normally, the standard of care. Um, and then the, the mean change, at least the most important um, output for me in terms of functional improvement is this change in BCVA, which is an improvement in reading the, the letters on the wall that you'll see at the, uh, the optometrist's office. So they measure this in, in terms of the number of letters that are added uh, after treatment compared to before. So they get an average improvement here of five letters, although three of them are non-responders. So the average of just the responders, I believe, was about 10. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So they're looking to increase this cohort or increase the number of cohorts to see whether or not they can get uh, more improvement in, in this treatment with higher, higher, higher genome copies per eye. So that data is going to be very interesting, and we're going to see more of it at the end of this year. But the other thing to note is that the treatment is durable. We see here that the expression actually seems to go up after between one month and one year, which is very good to see. Uh, everybody's concerned about the durability of gene therapies, and I, I don't blame them, especially because the cost is so expensive up front unless they're doing something uh, unique about the, the payment structure. So the other thing, like I mentioned, 50% of subjects treated with RGX314 continue to remain free of anti-VEGF injections. So that's a, that's pretty huge. They, they only need one injection and they're able to continue to remain free of needing these antibody injections in their eye, which is nice. So just to show the durability of the responders here, we see that at one month, 
um, all three patients still maintain about 250.5 nanograms per mil of the, the protein in the aqueous humor. And I say aqueous humor because that's a proxy for what, uh, for what I believe they're, they're looking for, which is the retina. So the retina is where this expression is, and uh, the aqueous humor should be a bit lower, so they think that it's even higher when it comes to the actual retinal expression. And now they don't actually mention, in the call, I looked at the transcript, and they didn't actually mention whether or not this is uh, the AAV protein they're measuring, some protein there, or actually measuring the anti-VEGF antibody expression, which would be ideal and what I think they're, they're talking about here, but I just wanted to mention that, oh, you know what, it's right here. No, but so the same thing. So I'm, I'm not too sure whether or not they're, they're trying to measure the vector or the actual expression of the, the, the protein product that's produced. So I couldn't find that info, so it makes me, you know, uh, I'm not too sure here. But it's, uh, it's nice to see that they get this durable expression anyway. So they're looking at top-line data, which is expected at the end of this year, and they're going to initiate a Phase 2B trial in wet AMD in 2019 of this year. Uh, so that's good news. It'll be nice to see... Um, this data, and they're also going to file an IND for diabetic retinopathy in the second half of this year, which uh, there's about 8 million patients for that right now, um, which, you know, is about, is four times bigger than the wet AMD indication, and all of the, all of the current products out right now uh, that are anti-VEGF antibodies have the indication for both, and maybe some sort of uh, other macular conditions. So the, the sales that I'm going to show um, include all of these indications all in one. But I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. I, I do want to just mention there are other programs that uh, Regenix has right now. So they're looking at these rare diseases, MPS2, MPS1, and CLN2. Uh, these diseases that we've talked about before in, in the context of Sangamo, there are enzyme deficiencies that are currently treated with ERT. And if you can administer some sort of gene therapy to get the cells to express the deficient protein, seemingly you can cure the disease. So we, we are going to see some data in the second half of this year in MPS2, and, uh, and that would be, would be nice to see. Um, you know, MPS1 and MPS2 do have competition, and I've talked about Sangamo before, uh, even though I, I, I don't know how I feel about their zinc finger technology. They, they are a, a competitor here. And then uh, another program that they're doing is this RGX501, which is a treatment for uh, homozygous familial, familial hypercholesterolemia. And we have talked about uh, FH here in the context of Madrigal, which showed positive data with their um, thyroid, uh, thyroid receptor beta agonist in, in helping in heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. So uh, Regenix here is going for the tougher disease, which is both alleles are mutated. And if for those who don't remember, it's a mutation in the LDL receptor. So cells can't uptake LDL from the blood and this leads to very, very high levels in the blood, and that increases these patients' risk for atherosclerosis and all sorts of, of brutal diseases that are associated with, with blood vessel uh, damage. So uh, they had a bit of a hiccup in their data originally because I think the steroids were um, elective, and a lot of patients ended up with this transaminase uh, problem, so they, they amended their clinical trial to include steroids exclusively, and we're now going to see all of the data that includes patients with steroids, and that's expected in the second half of this year. So so that'll be nice, too, to see if they can um, use their platform in, in this way to treat a mutation in the LDL receptor. But uh, I do got to say, between these programs, it's definitely the RGX314 here that, that is the one that could bring in the most revenue for them, uh, I believe, at this point. Now, in terms of revenue that they're already getting, uh, I do want to touch on the Zolgensma story. And this is indicative of, you know, this is one of their partnered programs and they have 20. So if you imagine this multiplied by 20, that would obviously be a lot of revenue, even though it'll take some time for it to materialize. But uh, Regenix earned a $3.5 million milestone payment from Avexis for the launch. So this FDA approval, uh, bam, $3.5 million. Very nice. They get an additional 80 million milestone payment upon the achievement of $1 billion in sales, and they have a tiered royalty on Zilgensma sales up to a low double digit percentage. You know, in my model, I put 10% just to, to be conservative, and up to date, they've earned $190 million from Avexis. 
So peak sales of Zolgensma have been expected around 2 billion, and then we can assume about 200 million um, per year is uh, will be issued to uh, Regener Regenix for this uh, this uh, this compound. So that is uh, where we're at, and you know it's not a ton of cash really for them long term. We really the uh, we want to hit some blockbuster numbers before we really see that uh, the company is going to be valued at what it is right now. So if we go forward here, and my mouse just died for some reason. Anyway, so the the way I see it is we really need to focus on uh, RGX three one four because this is the one that's going to bring in a ton of revenue if we compare the sales of the other anti VEGF therapies. And if we look at that, we can see here that uh, the current anti-VEGF sales, which include two products, and there's more out there, but Ilea is a Regeneron product, $4 billion in sales in 2018. Lucentis, which is a Novartis drug, $2 billion in sales in 2018. So, you know, these are huge numbers. And, um, and just to show the effectiveness of the treatment, we see here that Ilea, the patients gain an average of eight letters, Whereas in Lucentis, they gain an average of seven letters. Now, remember what I said with the treatment of 314, the average gain was five letters. Now, if you take away the patients that weren't responders, the, the average gain was 10. Yeah, so 10. I've got it written down here. So, uh, you know, there's, there's creative ways that the companies can, can get patients to take their drug. You know, if they provide some sort of... Um, some sort of assurance that they'll get their money back if they become if they're non-responders to the treatment then you know seemingly patients could still be okay with with going through with the therapy uh, knowing that they can get their money back if they become a non-responder so it's tough to to assume that the average letter gain is the best way to look at it really what we should look at are the responders because they're the ones that are going to have the most benefit from the the treatment so you know, a one-time therapy has a huge benefit for not needing the, the 12 injections per year. And if the therapy can be as competitive as the anti-VEGF antibody injections, I think this could make a huge impact in, in the field. And I think customers or customers of ILEA and Lucentis would absolutely want to go to towards Regenix to, to get this therapy. So what we need to wait for really is cohort four and five to see if the efficacy is uh, improved or at least matched to the current therapies. And what I really want to see is a larger study. So with six patients and half of them being responders, uh, it's tough to assume that every patient will respond the same way. So in the phase, you know, a phase three or this phase two B that's upcoming, it'd be nice to see how, um, how many patients do become responders and how effective the treatment is in those responders. So that's kind of where I see it, but we can make assumptions based on these uh, th sales to anticipate what the net present value of Regenix would be. And so I don't put too much value in the other rare diseases just yet because they're so early. And, you know, it's it's possible that they're going to end up focusing only on one or two of them. So for me to put some sort of dollar value on them today doesn't seem to make too much sense. But, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of ways to interpret this, uh, depending on who you talk to. So my verdict at about 1.8 billion dollar market cap is that a lot of the upside is already priced in so i don't i don't consider uh regenix right now as a buy my model shows that if if they have one billion dollars in peak sales for uh, rgx 314 net present value is about two billion if they reach two billion in sales net present value is about four billion so it does depend on how much of an impact you think it's going to make on the market and with an n of six in their top cohort right now i'm not i'm not quite there so for me, I want to see a little bit more data. Um, there's also some IP uncertainty that, that I haven't looked into, and it's definitely something that before I take a position, I want to look into. So I'm not too sure uh, on their patent situation, how, how it works and how it works with their licensors. So for instance, the AAV9 for, for spinal muscular atrophy, uh, does that when does that patent expire? Do they have a lot of competition that might actually come out? Or are the royalty payments going to stop after then? Uh, when it comes to Novartis paying uh, Regenix. So I'm not too sure, and I need to look into that a little bit more. It, it seemed like a big rabbit hole that I would have had to go down to if I were to do that for this video. So 
I'm, uh, I'm not going to do that, but I, I need to before I feel better about this. But so, uh, back to the wet AMD. Um, if you think that they're going to make about $2 billion in peak sales on that treatment, and they might even make four. If you look at ILEA, you know, they made four, $4 billion in 2018. If you think they can do that, then uh, I see their net present value at, at double, almost more than double what they are right now. So, you know, it's a share price of like a hundred bucks and, uh, and it's possible, but you know, that's the, that's the uncertainty that we have right now in terms of their cash position. Uh, they're, they're pretty good about half a billion dollars at the end of Q1 of 19. So seemingly they'll be able to continue all of their programs, uh, to some extent anyway. And we're going to see some data on all of these programs in the second half of this year. So it is going to be a bit of a roller coaster if we get some positive news and some negative news. And I think for me, I could I could see myself being a buyer of of the stock, maybe at one billion dollar market cap or or one point one, one point two. But at one point eight right now, I feel like um, I need to see more data. And I know, you know, once the data comes out, it's it's not the best time to buy because it's already been priced in. But I think I need to see more data before I I buy in at this generous valuation. All right. So with that, uh, this week I am traveling for business. I have to get up at like 3 a.m. tomorrow morning, which I'm not excited about to go fly to Montreal. But uh, yeah, I might actually have time to look into other companies since I'll be on a flight for so long. But um, that's what it is. So companies to look at. I still have this list with uh, with a couple other ones that I might add soon, although the list seemingly tends to only grow, which I get because there's a lot of exciting stuff out there. Uh, we did not see tariffs today. So I think today was supposed to be the deadline for tariffs on Mexico if they were not going to help with border security. And I believe that got resolved. So uh, that's good news, although it made for a hectic week last week. And then this week, we expect to see prints on CPI, June 12th. Uh, this is going to be interesting because since tariffs have been instituted, we're going to get to see whether or not it has, in fa- has affected uh, inflation and prices here at home. So uh, looking forward to that. Initial jobless claims, that is a leading indicator for the market, if you ask me. So interested in seeing that on June 13th, and then we get some retail sales data for June 14th. Okay, uh, I apologize for the camera thing. My mouse is uh, completely dead, but we're going to, to get through it. So before I wrap up, just want to get through a quick portfolio thing. So I continue to get crushed on Nash stocks. Oh, the mouse is back. Okay. So Nash stocks, yeah, continue to get hammered. I think today was a good day for the XBI, but uh, Nash is, you know, continues to to look bad. I think it will have its day in the sun like gene therapy is having right now, but it's going to take some time. You know, there's only like one approved drug right now that, or no, one drug that saw good uh, phase three data, I believe the intercept drug. And uh, we still need to get FD approval for that. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah. So once that happens, then maybe we'll start to see some money flow in. But until then, it's just going to be a slow chug forward. But I, uh, I do like these two Nash companies, and I think they will have their day. But until then, it's, uh, it's really all about gene therapy. So uh, if we look at Unicure, there's buyout rumors going around. And so these prices here are the end of last week. So I'm a bit, a bit slow here, but and this is all different as of today, but it's still useful. Um, yeah, so Unicure, you know, I took a, s- a small position when it uh, dropped a bunch, and now it's at 75, and, you know, sure, why not? Let's uh, let's go with the gene therapy thing while it lasts, but um, eventually I think Nash will, will come through. So I did buy Bluebird today at uh, 120.95, and, uh, yeah, I'm down on them quite a bit, but I do think that they're going to uh, to do well long term. Uh, I, I also sold Illumina at 314. I tweeted about this in, in shame because the stock was like hovering around 340, I think, today. And, uh, you know, this is the game we play. But I, I do feel a lot better about having only gross exposure of 70% right now, given that any tweet can destroy the market seemingly. So that's okay with me, even though I did lose out on a lot of gains here. And yeah, that's uh, that's about it, actually. So if we look at the year to date, as of last week, I'm hovering around 6%, uh, right around the Dow Jones. It is what it is. There's still uh, still about six and a half months to go before I can try and uh, try and outdo the market here. 
volatility did go down quite a bit at the end of last week because it seemed like there was a resolution in the tariff situation. And uh, I think today would only have exacerbated this since the market was mostly up, although it gave some gains back at the end of the day. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's how it is. And I also, I still have some uh, XBI calendar spreads open just to hedge in case the market does take a pretty uh, substantial downturn. But um, let's, uh, let's keep our fingers crossed that that's not going to happen. So with that, I want to thank everybody for watching. Please like, subscribe, leave me a comment, or uh, follow me on Twitter at Matthew Lepoir. And yeah, that's about it. So thank you guys so much, and we'll see you next time.